thanks for coming, everyone. Thanks for organizing not just this uh, session, but this uh, whole event here in uh, Copenhagen. Uh, I'm a, uh, a native Dane, so uh, it's great to uh, just travel to the capital uh, uh, these days to uh, experience all these wonderful talks and, uh, and discussions. I have 20 minutes now to talk about this term diagnostic cultures and their languages of suffering, as I uh, call them. And I approach this, uh, which was mentioned, from a psychological perspective. I'm a professor of general psychology, that's true. I also have a background in philosophy, and in the research groups that I'm a part of, we try both to uh, do empirical work. We look at what people do with the diagnosis they are given, with the diagnosis that they sometimes actively seek out, and we find that people are really uh, creative. Uh, it's not the case that people are just given this uh, category, put on their forehead, and then they just act in a certain way. Um, it's very unpredictable what people uh, do, how they interpret themselves before and after uh, being given a uh, diagnosis. But I'm also, with this background in philosophy, interested in more conceptual issues about what it means when we talk about mental illness, mental disorder. Uh, these are very difficult concepts to unfold. Uh, some have claimed that they are simply meaningless. Uh, Thomas Sass, the famous anti-psychiatric uh, uh, argument, uh, others try to, uh, to, to, to unpack them uh, and discuss uh, what they uh, mean, uh, which of course is uh, related to empirical work, but also uh, an exercise in itself. And I might also touch a bit upon that. Um, this is very shameless. Uh, sorry for this, uh, ad ad advertising my own book. <laughs> but if some of you are interested in reading more about what I'm talking about, I published this a few years ago. Uh, the book is simply called Diagnostic Cultures. It's in English, a cultural approach to the pathologization of modern life. And I'm going to talk about that specific term as well, what it means to pathologize and why that is such a big trend in contemporary society. Um, this will end my, uh, the introduction of myself, <laughs> don't worry. But uh, I've been working for the past uh, 10 years or so on three uh, different research projects. The first one was called Diagnostic Cultures. We looked at uh, the impact of diagnosis, uh, particularly depression and ADHD. Uh, and I was mainly responsible for the ADHD case on diagnosed uh, individuals. I did um, ethnographic field work. Uh, in a self-help group with adults who uh, had been given this diagnose, uh, diagnosis in their adult lives. Uh, I uh, visited them in their homes and followed them and interviewed them. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I learned a lot from that uh, and I'll return to that in, in a while. Next, we did a project on the culture of grief, looking at the ongoing pathologization of bereavement and reactions to bereavement. Uh, in the ICD-11, there is the uh, prolonged grief disorder category, and we wanted to see what happened when this diagnosis was implemented into the Danish healthcare, healthcare system. So on Brustrøm, who is the big boss in Denmark in, in the healthcare system, he sort of promised us, uh, I had a conversation with him, that um, uh, the, the, the health uh, authorities in Denmark w would implement this diagnosis. They would embrace it. He, he thought it was a legitimate and valid diagnosis, but it never materialized during these five years uh, because the people who were put in charge of <laughs> figuring out how to do this uh, sort of blew up uh, and it ended and no one knows what is going to happen now. Uh, but but, but we, we nevertheless followed. Uh, how the culture of grief uh, is now changing in Denmark in a medicalized direction away from, uh, you could say, sorrow, grief being something you should uh, go through uh, as a natural part of life, maybe also in order to honor the uh, deceased person. Uh, and now grief is something you do for your own sake so to say, with all the risk factors involved, it can easily go wrong and you can grieve too much and too intensely and too long and receive this diagnosis. 
The current project that we're working on is called Places, Psychopathology in Eco-Social Niches. We explore the social, cultural and spatial contexts of anxiety and ADHD. It sort of follows the Diagnostic Cultures project um, from, from years ago. Uh, but, but we look more at the environments in which people live. Uh, when I visit people with an ADHD diagnosis in their homes, uh, many of them, if not all of them, have changed their homes, changed their routines after being given the diagnosis. Some of them have figured out interesting, creative ways of organizing their, their homes, their work environment, perhaps their educational context. And we would like to sort of um, gather all the experience that's, that these people have, uh, have developed in order to give it back to the communities. But, but we also still have a critical interest in why this diagnosis, as well as others, are sort of expanding. Uh, I believe pathologization is a societal megatrend alongside other more well-known terms, such as individualization, which is mentioned in every sociology textbook, secularization, also mentioned in all these uh, cultural uh, histories. I think we need to put pathologization up there because it's a fundamental change in how we view uh, human life and human nature. And a semi-formal definition could be something like this. When something which used to be considered as a common human problem or a simple deviance from a norm is transformed into a disease or disorder that can be diagnosed and should be treated, then we have pathologization. Uh, this is... Um, supposed to be value neutral. <laughs> uh, in principle, we can talk about valid and legitimate forms of pathologization. If we discover that something is in fact a mental illness, or it can be critical if we pathologize in a way in which we shouldn't, uh, when we think of something as a disorder, which really is not uh, such a thing. But uh, this mega trend follows three lines of development, I believe. This is a much bigger argument, of course, that I just tried to really uh, treat very, very briefly here. Health has become a core value for the individual. Many researchers talk about healthism. Uh, I'm a victim of that myself. I was on the treadmill just before coming here. I had to do my five kilometers uh, today. Uh, that's why I, I'm all sweaty and <laughs> because you cannot stop sweating once you're on the treadmill. Um, people no longer think of their own. Um, well-being, if you will, just in terms of the old axis between uh, being healthy, being well, or being ill. <laughs> that, that's sort of the old one, right? Uh, most of the time, hopefully we are well, and we're, when we're not, we go to, to see the doctor. Uh, hopefully we can get well again. If not, we're going to die. But we sort of never oscillate on this axis. We have replaced that with the axis of health, healthy and unhealthy. Uh, which already contributes a lot to pathologization because many more people are unhealthy compared to those who are ill. In fact, we're all unhealthy. Now you're all sitting down. You probably heard that sitting is the new smoking. You display unhealthy behavior. Maybe you ate some cake before. Uh, even if you do 5K on the treadmill like I did, it cannot compensate for this unhealthy behavior of sitting down right now. So this is a mega trend in our time. We have this uh, reflective view on ourselves all the time in terms of, uh, of health. Uh, and now with this focus on uh, expanding disease definition related to the session, uh, there is uh, in modern society a focus on risk, on pre-disease related of course to being unhealthy as something that uh, happens before you become ill. And finally, from avoiding a diagnosis to winning one. When you look at the old anti-psychiatric literature, it was sort of meant to rescue people from evil psychiatrists. Uh, I, I get this image of, um, if you know, uh, the old Disney movies with the, the dog catchers uh, driving around, sort of capturing the dogs, putting them into the van and uh, stigmatizing them or something, you know, th that was the image of psychiatry back then. And now we see, staying with this metaphor, uh, the dogs running after the dog catcher, wanting to be caught, right? Um, because diagnoses have in fact many uh, benefits 
for people in modern society. Also the opposite, perhaps, but uh, many perceived uh, benefits. So this means that, and I, mean, I really experienced this because I had read the critical literature. I had read Thomas Sass, Ronald Lang, Michel Foucault, all those people. When I did my field work 10 years ago, uh, I wanted to rescue people from their diagnosis. <laughs> and I met 25 people who didn't want to be rescued, uh, but who wanted to have their diagnosis and were really happy. And then this guy comes from university being critical of the diagnosis that I have fought for for maybe five years, finally I have it. I remember one woman uh, telling me the best day of my life was when my doctor told me I had ADHD. Before he told me that I was lazy, after he told me that uh, I have ADHD, right? Um, and you don't hear that when you go to see a, uh, a, a GP or a doctor because of a somatic problem. You wouldn't say the, ber the best day of my life was when my doctor told me I had cancer. I know that's probably one of the worst days, but, but, but this testifies to a fundamental difference between psychiatry and, and, and somatic medicine. Um, I, I, I need to speed up um, because I want to focus on this term, the language of suffering as something that affects us all and is a driver when we talk about um, uh, pre-disease and, and this risk focus. Uh, Nick Rose, uh, who writes very, uh, in very f thoughtful ways and interesting ways about all these things, he, he, uh, he, he said this uh, many years ago, at any time and place, human discontents are inescapably shaped, molded, given expression, judged and is responded to in terms of certain languages of description and explanation, articulated by experts and authorities, leading to specific styles and forms of intervention. What then is specific to today. And David Healy gave one answer. In previous times, we passed on a culture to our children embodied in fairy tales, folklore about health, national myths and religious precepts, in which life's risks were put in a larger context of meaning. Now, an increasing part of what is transmitted centers on personal health for its own sake, figures for sugar and lipid levels, as increasing numbers of our children have diabetes or other dangerous metabolic states, or figures for peak respiratory flows as increasing numbers of young people have asthma, or statistics on some chemical imbalance as increasing numbers of being treated for ADHD, depression, or anxiety. Not only is such a culture two-dimensional, the very nature of human, it changes the very nature of human experience. I think this is very true, and I think this has not been given, uh, given enough attention in, 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 in public discussions. If you go to the... Um, uh, anthropological literature. This is a group of cultural psychologists, some of my colleagues, you could say, from the US. Uh, Richard Sweater is, is very famous for um, identifying these big three meta-narratives of suffering. The first one is the biomedical narrative, which we're all familiar with. Suffering is explained as a result of material events in the body and brain. It's almost the only one we have left, the only narrative we have. But if you go around to the world's cultures, it's not the only one. In some parts of the world, it's unknown. In other parts, it's quite rare. Um, you have the moral narrative in many places. Suffering is a consequence of a breach in the moral order. You did something wrong and now you're punished. Or the interpersonal narrative. Suffering is understood with reference to magic, witchcrafts, or spirits. Um, and of course, I'm very happy to live in a culture where we have access to one, to number one. Uh, I don't believe in witchcrafts or spirits. That's not, not, not the point. But the big problem, if we only have number one, is that there is no longer any meaning to suffering. Um, so all contextual meaning giving factors disappear. And I think this explains the current crisis, if I can allow, be allowed to use that word, of, of psychiatry. Um, this is something I'm working on at the moment. Uh, it's a bit complex, but I'm just going to give a brief introduction to it. Uh, many, many people now, not just outsiders, anti-psychiatrists and so on, but people uh, centrally placed within psychiatry are dissatisfied and unhappy with the way psychiatry has been developing. With the DSM-5 and the ICD-11, the diagnostic expansion, more and more diagnoses are formulated. Uh, a, a person like Randolph Ness, 
who was a, a key person in the development of uh, evolutionary medicine and now evolutionary psychiatry has named the central problem of psychiatry VSAD. It means viewing symptoms as diseases. And if you want a source, it's his book, uh, Good Reasons for Bad Feelings. I can really recommend that from 2019. Good Reasons for Bad Feelings, uh, Randolph Ness. And he says, this is the problem. This is what psychiatry is doing. In somatic medicine, we view symptoms not as the disease, but typically actually, not always, but often, as the organism's way of protecting itself from a pathogenic agent, right? So we cough because there's something inside that needs to, and we, we vomit for the same reason, perhaps. We have fever uh, in order to kill something uh, in, in our body. We feel pain uh, to alert us that something is dangerous and we need to remove ourselves and so on. All these are symptoms. That's why people go to the doctor, but none of these symptoms are diseases. They are ways in which the, the organism uh, protects the person, you know, uh, so to say. But in, in psychiatry, uh, especially after 1918, DSM-3, I guess many of you are familiar with this story, uh, psychiatry moved from etiological understandings of why people are uh, having problems to diagnostic understandings based purely on symptoms. So now psychiatry says, well, the disease simply is the symptoms. So we view symptoms as diseases. And this means that there's no limit to the number of diagnoses we can create. We can go on and on and on and aggregate clusters of symptoms. And uh, if we are really entrepreneurial, we can name that cluster after ourselves and call it Brinkman's disease. Uh, a number, I'm, I'm of course being a bit, uh, uh, well, sorry, uh, it's too much. But uh, you, you, you see what I mean, right? Uh, because it's just symptoms. Um, so, and, and as I said, many people, are dissatisfied with this. This is a really mainstream, conventional critique, nothing radical about it, but no one knows what to do. Well, there are some suggestions. Uh, there is the neuroscientific solution. Thomas Insel from the National Institute of Mental Health back then said, we need to stop. We need to begin from scratch by uh, mapping the brain functions, uh, the research domain criteria, RDOC, RDOC um, would, would, would be much better. I sympathize, sympathize with that. I'm a philosophical materialist in, in that sense. I believe for all psychiatric problems, there is a material underpinning, right? But the problem is that there are still no valid biomarkers. We cannot formulate a diagnosis in psychiatry based on uh, blood, a blood sample or brain scan or, or, or something like that. So in theory, <laughs> this would be great, but in practice, we don't know if it will ever materialize. The other solution, or another solution, is the contextual one. Here, just to exemplify, we have the power thread meaning framework. Uh, a group of British psychi psychologists saying uh, we need to stop aggregating clusters of symptoms and begin with context. Instead of ha asking what's wrong with you and counting uh, symptoms, we should ask what has happened to you. Because almost any form of human distress when we think of psychology uh, can be explained in terms of what has happened to people. Uh, that's why we have so much comorbidity, <laughs> because the, the things that will make you really depressed are also the things that will make you really uh, fearful and anxious. Uh, so anxiety and depression go together, not because you have two diseases, but because you have experienced something that for a human being naturally generates this kind of response in the large majority of cases, right? Um, but again, there is, I, I sympathize with that as well. But I think there is a missing uh, part, namely, they cannot really explain why some people uh, sort of carry a problem from one context to the other. So they need some person variable that they lack, just as Thomas Insel and the neuro people need some context uh, orientation. So now, I would like to put these two together in a way uh, and let them, um, whoa, one minute, um, perhaps, perhaps to integrate them uh, in a relational theory. Dorte Gannik, who uh, was a great Danish medical sociologist, developed this situational theory of uh, illness and disease. 
stating that illness is never just something in the person, it's never just something in the environment, it's always something in the relation between a person and an environment. I think that's what we need to focus on. And in order to do that, we need to expand the palette of our languages of suffering, not just as professionals, practitioners, researchers, but really to re-educate the public uh, in order for everyone to understand that the sufferings that humans experience cannot simply be understood in terms of the diagnostic language, which everyone has now appropriated. There is a religious language, it's not one that I use myself, but let's say 80% of people around the world do that, understanding the suffering people experience as God's will. There is meaning to suffering. Uh, we need an existential language. You're now in the country of Søren Kierkegaard. Uh, fear and trembling, the concept of anxiety, all these works on uh, human existence, arguing that, well, it's actually normal for self-reflective mortals like human beings to feel uh, anxiety. And in order to distinguish between clinical problems and normal human suffering, we need to understand this existential dimension. A moral language, uh, shame, anger, guilt, these are all moral emotions that are deeply painful to humans, but nevertheless uh, inescapable. And if we cannot understand through a rich moral language what is going on, we, we will just pathologize them, say, oh, you feel shame, uh, that's not good, uh, go to a, a therapist and remove this shame. Uh, well, I wish uh, that, you know, we could understand shame as a necessary human emotion, or guilt, right, um, and so on. I, and, and a political language, let me end by this, uh, you've probably seen this before, is a very, very, very old joke on the internet. Uh, it's a mockery of these ads that you see in the US that sell uh, prescription drugs directly to consumers, that's allowed in the US. If you feel sad and depressed, if you're anxious, worried about the future and feeling isolated and alone, you might suffer from capitalism. I'm not saying that capitalism, whatever that is, is to blame for all what I'm talking about, but it's interesting to see the symptoms list. Because symptoms may include homelessness, unemployment, poverty, hunger, feelings of powerlessness, fear, apathy, etc. Of course, in, with this, they want you to go and, and see your local union because it's about uh, the 1st of May. Uh, but I think it's a reminder that many of the factors that generate distress in people's lives are structural, contextual, uh, and should be addressed politically instead of through the language of psychiatry. Uh, I hope to be able to discuss this with, with everyone here. Uh, thank you for thank you for listening to me now and now for, for the next speaker. Thank you.